Uh, Mr. Lincoln. I'm surprised you're still awake. It's after midnight. Uh, I can never sleep on the eve of a battle. Well, I have the same affliction. May I sit with you for a moment? Of course, sir. <clears throat> you look worried, Mars. What's on your mind? I'll not mince words, sir. If we lose the battle tomorrow, we lose Pennsylvania. And if that happens... Yes, Washington City will be surrounded. Yes, sir. Quite like it here in the capital, do you? I prefer Ohio. Nothing beats home. I lived in Springfield, Illinois for 22 years. You ever been to Springfield, Mars? No, sir. I recall one occasion where a visitor came to town for the first time. A minister, I think he was. He was to give a series of lectures. When he arrived, he realized that he needed the state secretary's permission to give any lectures, so he walked down to the state capitol and knocked on the secretary's door. Come in, said the secretary. What can I do for you, sir? The minister laid out his request, and the state secretary said, Well, before I give you my answer, tell me this. What are your lectures about? Humbly, the minister replied, The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and the secretary said, Well, don't bother, because if the Lord's seen Springfield once, he ain't coming back. <laughs> <laughs> you told me that one before. Oh. Have I? You've told it to everyone under the sun, Mr. President. Yes, well, I suppose I have. I do hope that I get to see Springfield once again before I'm... You will, sir. If we fall at Gettysburg, can we still win the war? Well, then I reckon we better win it then. Yes, sir. We will meet them on the field, Mars, and we will beat them back. I pray you're right. But no matter the outcome tomorrow, you must stand firm. Even if the worst should come to pass, if the Army of the Potomac should fall, if the rebels should take Washington, you must stay the course. You must. Do you understand? Yes, Mr. President. I will never surrender. The answer is no, Stanton. You said you needed evidence for treason. Now you have it. This isn't evidence. It's the word of Sanford Conover, an accused perjurer, against the President of the United States. Those charges are false and you know it. In the court of public opinion, Mr. Conover is guilty. He'll be found guilty at trial as well. I've given you my answer, Mr. Stanton, and it's final. If you won't introduce an article for treason, I'll find a congressman who will. Edwin, go easy. Mr. Seward, surely you don't support this course of action. Mr. Bingham, you are the one who vouched for Mr. Conover during the tribunal. Have you considered the possibility he's telling the truth? Yes, of course. But I've also considered the possibility that Sanford Conover is bound for the Dry Tortugas prison and that he'll say or do anything to spare him that fate. I'll not stand before the Senate and argue a dubious case with insufficient evidence. I don't know if Andrew Johnson conspired with Jefferson Davis. I don't know if he's an unwitting puppet for the Confederacy. I don't know, and I don't care. If he's not intentionally doing Jefferson Davis's bidding, he might as well be. There's no question he's the South's preferred option for president, and why? Because every move Johnson makes is in service of the rebellion at the expense of the freedmen. You're not wrong, Stanton. But do you want to be right, or do you want to win? We have Johnson dead to rights on a conspiracy to violate the Tenure of Office Act. The articles will pass the House tomorrow. And if we stay the course, we'll likely have the votes to convict him in the Senate, too. But if you push for treason, the moderates will pull away from you and put their support behind Johnson. And so will I. Do you understand? You've won the first battle, Stanton. 
Take the victory and be satisfied. Edwin. Don't, don't you do it. Do what? Lecture me. You don't need a lecture. You already know he's right. Now, I was going to ask you a question. Yeah. Well, go on, then. When's the last time you've had a bath? <laughs> How long uh, have you been locked in your office? Uh, I've lost count of the days. Well, it shows. My vanity is the least of my concerns. Not the least of mine. You're positively right. <laughs> When's the last time you've seen a doctor? I will return to my regular appointments when this is over. Have you spoken to your wife? No. Then perhaps you should call on her at home. No, I won't leave this office, not till it's done. Here's a piece of unsolicited advice. For once in your life, listen to your friends. Listen to Mr. Bingham. Drop this Sanford Conover nonsense and let Congress do their job. Will you? Yes. Good. And do us all a favor. What's that? Take a bath. Distinguished gentlemen of the Senate, I am here today to present to you articles of impeachment against President Andrew Johnson. The House voted yesterday 126 to 47 in favor of adopting these articles. Now the decision lies with you. I do not wish today to be a mere eater-up of syllables, a mere snapper-up of unconsidered trifles. Rather, I wish today to speak to your hearts as men. President Johnson did conspire to violate the Tenure of Office Act. He did unlawfully terminate Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton, and he did seek to undermine this very body in the eyes of the public. Of this, there is no doubt. This proceeding is about more than the narrow legal questions we will thoroughly examine these next few weeks. Rather, this is a question over the rule of law, the foundations of our democracy, and the very soul of this country. Since man was upon this earth, there has never been a bolder piece of effrontery than that which Andrew Johnson has thrust upon his people. The prosecution stands this day pleading for the violated majesty of the law. By the graves of a half million martyred hero patriots. Patriots who made death beautiful by their sacrifice. For this country, for the constitution, and for the law. Do not let their sacrifice, and the sacrifice of Mr. Lincoln, be for nothing. Do your sacred duty. When the time comes, vote Andrew Johnson what you know in your hearts he is. Guilty. 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 Mr. President, the loyal readers of the New York Daily Tribune want to know, how does it feel to be the first president impeached in United States history? Oh, hell, somebody's got to be first. Adams was the first president to marry a relative. Jackson, the first to have killed a man in a duel. Lincoln was the first to pardon the national turkey. But not me. I ate the goddamn thing. <laughs> I was the first to do that long before I was the first to be impeached. You're also the first president to preside over two war secretaries at the same time. Do you regret your decision to appoint Mr. Thomas? Lorenzo Thomas is a queer gentleman. No doubt about it. And a drunk, too. How's that my fault? Was it liquor that prompted Mr. Thomas to storm into the war department? Or did you order him to? Hell, you know how it is with these military types. How much fuss they like to make. How they like to show their authority. I can't be held personally responsible for the actions of a drunk like Lorenzo Thomas. Since you brought up the subject of inebriation. I brought you here to talk about all the great things happening in our country. All you want to do is rake me over the coals. Mr. President, during the Swing Around the Circle Tour in 1866, were you not on multiple occasions inebriated when you spoke to the people of this country? I didn't drink half as much as one or two others. To whom do you refer, sir? I've seen General Grant in a state of drunkenness so severe he could not stand upright. 
and yet I don't see you and your friends in the press asking him these kind of questions. Mr. President, may I have a moment? I'm in the middle of something here, Wells. Mr. President, you claimed the 40th Congress of the United States was not a lawful body and that, as such, the 13th and 14th Amendments were unlawful. That doesn't sound like me. You also said on multiple occasions that the white race is superior to the Negro. Do you deny that as well? If I used any rough expressions, those words were put into my mouth by my enemies, by those hecklers in the crowd. But you did say those words, sir. They were written down by journalists. Don't believe everything you read, son. Those words are now immortalized in Congress's articles of impeachment. Do you believe your presidency can survive the Senate, sir? Now you listen here, you little rat. If you ever want to be invited to the White House again... Forgive me, sir, but the president is needed on urgent matters of state. I'm afraid this interview is over. Of course, Secretary Wells. Good day, then. Be nice to me now. Treat me fairly, you hear? I will let you speak for yourself, Mr. President. When you talk to the press, Mr. President, you only give your enemies more ammunition against you. I need to get out in front of this, Wells. I need to fight back. You need to be presidential. No more interviews, no more firing off at the mouth. Take your case to the people in another way. The anniversary of Mr. Lincoln's death is in a few weeks' time. The city's erected a statue in his honor. Oh, I'm aware. Every morning I see that stony son of a bitch looking down his nose at me. There's a dedication ceremony the morning of April 15th. I suggest you make a speech. Didn't you just say to keep my mouth shut? A prepared speech, sir. I'll write it myself if you like. Sit down, Wells. Have a drink. No, thank you, Mr. President. I wasn't asking. There are 54 senators, Wells. Only nine Democrats. I need 19 votes for acquittal. Three Republicans have already declared their support for you. Which leaves my fate in the hands of seven Republicans. Seven moderate Republicans. Those bleeding hearts wouldn't piss on me if I was on fire. Make the speech, Mr. President. Show the moderate Republicans Andrew Johnson is their president, too. You can write it up, Wells, and I'll deliver it. I'm afraid a speech ain't gonna get the job done. There are other, more effective ways to persuade senators. Such as? I may not have powerful friends in Washington City like you, Wells, but I got plenty below the Mason-Dixon. Discreet friends with deep pockets. Mr. President, violating the Tenure of Office Act may not be a high crime and misdemeanor, but bribing senators most certainly is. You're right. I can't bribe senators. But if my friends down south were to come to my aid, then perhaps I'd be inclined to thank them with a few lucrative government contracts. Get it done, Wells. Mr. President, I strongly oppose this course of action. Perhaps I didn't make myself clear. I'm not asking. Mr. Stanton. Robert Lincoln, it is certainly good to see you back in Washington City. I believe you know Mr. Bingham? Uh, yes, of course. How do you do, sir? How do you do? You are here for the dedication, I assume. Yes, my fiancé and I arrived uh, just this morning. Fiancé? Do I know the girl? Who is she? Mary Harlan. The senator's daughter? It seems I have a type. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to say anything, but congratulations. Yeah, she's a lovely woman, smart and loyal. Well, I couldn't be happier for you. Thank you, sir. I would ask how you're doing. <laughs> yes. Oh, forgive my unsightly appearance. I've not been outside these walls in many a night. When is the vote? Still a few weeks away. Will the Republicans carry it? You tell me. Can we count on your future father-in-law's vote? That's why I'm here, Mr. Stanton. Senator Harlan asked me to call on you. A representative from an investing company down south approached Senator Harlan, offered him a big pile of money. To get it, all he has to do is cast his vote in favor of Andrew Johnson. Oh, for God's sake. Who was this man? Well, we don't know. He wouldn't give his name. Who owns the company? No one. Senator Harlan looked into it. I'm afraid the paper trail leads to nowhere. There are no employees, no address, no, no place of business, nothing. It's only a bank account with a big pile of money inside. How much money? $150,000. Good God. Thank you, Robert. And thanks, Senator Harlan, for bringing this to our attention. 
Johnson fired Harlan from the cabinet, don't forget. Oh, I haven't. And neither has my future father-in-law. The senator from Iowa stands with you, sir. Hmm. You know, Johnson's making a speech today. I heard. <laughs> my father's liable to roll over in his grave, all the way from Springfield. I'm going to make your father's voice heard as well. The people haven't forgotten him, Robert. If Johnson has, perhaps the sound of my cannons will remind him. I look forward to hearing that. Good luck. How close is this vote going to be? Close. It'll come down to a handful of senators. You need to tip the scales in our direction, Mr. Bingham. Do you have something in mind? Marshal McPhail? Yes, Mr. Secretary? Call on the reporter for the New York Daily Tribune, set up an interview. Tell him I'll only speak in person and only on the condition of anonymity. Shall I bring the reporter here to your office? No. Have him meet me at Ella Starr's hotel on the outskirts of town. Yes, sir. Ella Starr? The witness from the tribunal? It's, it's best you don't know the details. Mr. Stanton... He's buying votes, Bingham. I don't have to remind you what's at stake here. You know what my wife found on our doorstep yesterday morning? A note written in red ink. Drawings of skulls and crossbones and coffins in the margins. The message read, Death to Traitors. I know what's at stake, Mr. Stanton. This struggle has been the great work of my life. Do what you have to do. Well, I'll admit, I'm surprised to hear you say that. As Mr. Stevens said on the floor of the house, if we don't kill the beast, it will kill us. From the New York Daily Tribune, Paradise Lost. Our readers may recall that we published a puzzling note left on the night of bloody murder from Booth to then Vice President Johnson. I don't wish to disturb you. Are you at home? J. Wilkes Booth. At the time, it was easily explained away by the administration. The nation, in its naivete, was all too ready to ignore the unimaginable truth. But now, like Adam, we have eaten from the tree of knowledge and have lost our childish innocence. Recent revelations reveal a debaucherous relationship between Mr. Booth and Mr. Johnson while he served as the wartime governor of Tennessee. It is even rumored they frequented a pair of sisters in a Nashville den of sin. This depraved relationship continued all the way through Mr. Johnson's journey to the White House. All of this could be explained away as salacious gossip if it were not for the actions of the president these past three years, which open our eyes to the unwelcome truth. Andrew Johnson is not our friend. Even if he did not conspire with the South, he was surely aware of the plot. Perhaps Jefferson Davis and the other Confederates have secret proof of the president's involvement or other misdeeds, and have used it to twist him to their political whims. It would explain the leniency shown the Confederate leadership. It would also explain the many gifts the South has given Johnson in return. Even now, the South conspires to seduce senators through bribery and coercion, to vote in favor of Johnson's acquittal. In the end, no matter what the facts will show, there is no doubt if the South could have chosen anyone to champion their cause and succeed our martyred president, it was Andy the Toad Johnson. You wanted to see me, Mr. President? Uh, you know what that is, Wells? The War Department cannons? That is the sound of Mars reminding me who's really in charge around here. He's been reminding me all day, ever since I made that godforsaken speech. How's a person supposed to think with all that racket? A fine speech, sir. You acquitted yourself well. Yes, I was very presidential, wasn't I? Much good it'll do me. Especially with this flim-flam swirling around in the press. Mars is behind this. There's no doubt, sir. It's goddamn flim-flam, Wells! Not all of it, Mr. President. At any rate, it's having the desired effect. My friends tell me the Republicans will carry the vote. I pray it won't be the downfall of this nation. What's the preliminary count? 36 guilty, 18 not guilty. They have it by one vote. I thought we had this damn thing sewed up. We did. Then who flipped? Senator Ross of Kansas, a staunch moderate. D. 
deeply concerned by the allegations of impropriety in the press. His mind is made up. What are my options? You could fight it in the courts, but the general election is in November. By the time this makes it to the Supreme Court, there will already be a new president in the White House. Short of resignation, I'm afraid you don't have any. How many of the generals are loyal to me? Stanton has the army, Mr. President, and all the generals with it. But not the Navy, and not the militias either. Call them up, Wells. Have a march to the Maryland border and stand at the ready. And send word to the Navy captains, too. It's all hands on deck. No, Mr. Johnson. I am the President, Wells. My presidency is under attack. I need to know my Navy secretary is going to help me defend it. If you won't, then by God, I'll find someone who will. If you require my resignation, you will have it, sir. But the Navy stands with its country, not with you. I thought you were a patriot, Wells. I am. To Senator Vickers of Maryland from the White House. Message. Mr. Vickers, I write you today on the most confidential of matters. Not as a senator but in your capacity as Major General of the Maryland State Militia. As you well know, attempts are being made to subvert the will of the people and remove their lawful president. If the radicals cannot do it by impeachment, I fear they will do it by force. I hereby require you to raise the Maryland Militia with all haste. Your men are to assemble, take up arms, and stand ready to defend their president. Sincerely, Andrew Johnson. Mr. Stanton? How did you get past the guards? I'm still the Navy Secretary. Well, for the time being. Johnson send you? No. I'm here on my own accord. I'm worried for my country, Mr. Stanton. For our country. Well, if you care for your country, then stop doing Johnson's bidding and resign. The President is certainly pressing that issue. He's called up troops, Mr. Stanton. What? A thousand men from New Jersey, a full regiment from Kentucky, thousands more from Louisiana and Missouri, plus the entire Maryland militia. Why are you here? To threaten me into submission? The president will not listen to reason, Stanton. I'm here because I'm hoping you will. If you stand down... The Senate is voting in a few days' time, Wells. I couldn't stop that now, even if I wanted to. You and I both know that's not true. Whatever you are, Stanton, whatever our differences all these years, I know you're a patriot. Stand down. Come out of your office for the sake of the country. Marshal McPhail! Yes, sir. How many of my men are in reach of Washington? A hundred thousand in Maryland alone. Order their commander to march within a day's reach of the Capitol and await further instructions. Right away, Mr. Secretary. If it's a war Johnson wants, I'll give him one. You and Johnson are more alike than you care to admit. Pride has always been your downfall to both of you. I pray it won't be the downfall of this nation. Telegram, May 11th, 1868. The Senate will convene today in executive session to debate the articles of impeachment and declare their intentions on the question of Andrew Johnson's removal from the office of the President. Edward M. Stanton, Secretary of War. Mr. Seward. Mr. Eggert. Have a seat, please. Would you care for anything, Mr. Secretary? We can help ourselves, William. Thank you. I'll leave you getting into it. Thank you for coming. Of course. What can I do for you, sir? I'm worried about him, Major. I'm not a Major anymore. I know Edwin Stanton is a thing of your past. And I'm sure you had your reasons for resigning. God knows he's a difficult man. That's one way of putting it. Yes. I've spoken to his wife. She tells me he's ill. That he hasn't seen a doctor since he locked himself away in the War Department. He's not bathing. He's hardly eating. He's wasting away in that office. Ellen has written to him repeatedly, but he will not answer her. And what would you have me do? Talk some sense into him. He doesn't listen to me. He never has. You were his most trusted man, Mr. Eckert. You might find this hard to believe, but I think it's likely you're one of the closest friends he ever had. 
I begged him not to send Mary Surratt to the gallows, and he ignored my counsel. He murdered that woman, <sighs> Mr. Eckert. I know he didn't strangle her with his bare hands, but when he withheld that request from President Johnson, he put the rope around her neck. Wait, wait, wait. wait. What request? You don't know. No. The Tribunal Commission sent Johnson a clemency request for Mary Surratt, hours before her execution. I was under the impression the Tribunal held to the death sentence. That's what Stanton wants everyone to believe. If that's true, why didn't Johnson stop the execution? Because Stanton made sure that request never saw the light of day. I know you're worried for him, but with respect, I'm finished with Edwin Stanton. And you should be too. Mr. President, thank you for letting me pass the guards. You're not going to shoot me, are you? I suppose that depends on what you're about to say. Order your guards outside to stand down. Vacate this office immediately. If you don't, I'll have them arrested, and I'll order the Capitol Police to break down that door and turn their guns on you. Who do you really think those soldiers are going to listen to, Mr. President? Me or... <laughs> How many years do you think you have left, Stanton? The man in your condition? Hell, you'll be lucky if you make it to the end of my second term. You won't have a second term. Are you sure about that? I think the people of this country want unity. In the end, when I give it to them, they'll love me for it. You know what makes him better than you? Excuse me? Lincoln understood what we were doing was greater than the love of the people, greater than unification, greater than this country even. And he'd take to task anyone who would stand in his way, but you, the first whiff of dissent over the Negro's future, you tuck your tail between your legs. I don't like the taste of blood any more than you do, nor do I like the look of it on my hands. But change comes with a price. President Lincoln knew that, and that's why he'll be remembered forever. He'll be nothing more than a footnote. I know there's a price, Stanton. You and me just disagree about who's going to pay the tab. I'm curious, though. What do you think you'll be remembered for? I couldn't care less. Killing innocent women, perhaps? You signed Mary Surratt's death warrant. Her blood is on your hands, too. What about Mr. Lincoln's? You're always going on about my actions the night Lincoln was killed. What about you denying him security? Your friend, Mr. Seward, paid me a visit this morning. Told me a very interesting story. I think the people of this country are going to find it very interesting, too. To say nothing of the distinguished gentlemen of the United States Senate. You see, Stanton, I think when history measures me up against the things you've done... I think I'm going to come off smelling like a basket of roses. That will be all, Mr. President. You don't get to dismiss me, sir. Now you listen here and you listen good. When this vote's done, you will surrender this office. You can do it on your own, or I can drag you out and lock you away in the Montauk prison ship for the rest of your days. Choice is yours. If you intend to remove me by force, Mr. President, I suggest you bring along your militia. You goddamn fool. That will be all, Mr. President. Telegram, May 16th, 1868. The Senate will convene today to vote on articles of impeachment against the so-called President, Andrew Johnson. Edward M. Stanton, Secretary... <laughs> you look terrible. So do you. Well, oh, for God's sake, Seward, don't make me wait another moment. 35 guilty, 19 not guilty. 35? But that's... One vote short. Mr. Bingham assured me we had it by one vote. You did. I know you spoke to Johnson. Who else did you talk to? Senator Ross. I prevailed upon him to change his vote to acquittal. Why? Why would you do that? You know why. I spoke to Mr. Eckert. 
He told me what you've done. He told me everything. Everything I've done, I've done in service of Mr. Lincoln. Even withholding that clemency request? Even sending Mary Surratt to her grave? I told Johnson. I don't deny it. I told him you denied Lincoln's security, too. And when he suggested that I take that information to Senator Ross, I was more than happy to oblige him. Why? Because when it comes to unfettered power, he's not the one that I fear the most. When I spoke to Senator Ross, he asked me a question that befuddled me. He asked me why you did it. It occurred to me in that moment that I didn't have an answer. Get out. I think I have one now. I said get out. You loved him, Edwin. It's why you killed that woman. It's why you're locked in this office right now. But you failed him. He's gone. And nothing you've done or will do can change that now. But Edwin, your family is still here. Your wife and children are waiting for you at home. Go to them. No. What will you do? Order your troops to march on Washington? Johnson called up his militia. I answered it. A tyrant sense. There's only one tyrant, William, and he lives at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I think you need to ask yourself if you're on the right side of history here. No, I haven't been. I'm just as guilty as you are for keeping your secret all these years. But I'm done with that now. I can only pray God will forgive me for my part in all of this. God always forgives taught me that. Not this. Not me and not you. But no more. The Senate has spoken, Edwin. It's over. I decide. <laughs> I decide when it's over. You're walking this country right up to the precipice. Will you push us off the ledge? Will you truly risk thrusting your country back into open war? I told you I'd drive the goddamn boat into the bridge and bring the whole thing down with me. And by God, I meant it. If Johnson wants my office, let him come and take it. Are we done? Edwin, please. I said, are we done? Yes, we're done. Mr. Stanton. Here. What is this? It's from the President. Your letter of resignation. So you're doing his bidding now, too. It's time to come out. Tell the President I have no intention of resigning. Those guards out front, Stanton, your men, they have families. Mr. Langston. Order them to stand down. Surrender your office before it's too Mr. late. Mr. Langston, I will never surrender. <laughs> Is that blood? What does it look like? It looks like blood. Then why are you asking? <laughs> the people have turned on him, Mr. Langston. This impeachment proceeding has sullied his name. We may have lost the vote, but he'll lose the election. That monster will never see a second term. That, in and of itself, is an immeasurable victory. Do you know what they're building in West Virginia right now? A monument to the Confederacy. My people are being murdered in the streets. They're building statues and you're declaring victory. These people, Mr. Stanton, these rebels, they're enshrining into history the legacy of the rebellion. I'll tear the goddamn thing down myself. I'll just build another one. And another. And another, and another, until every city, town, valley, and village in the South is littered with monuments. So that generation after generation of white men can be taught the story of how their ancestors lost the battle in the field, only to win the war in the bloody aftermath. All the proof they'll need will be found on the faces of those statues. The freedmen have been driven from their lands. The slavers have reclaimed their property. Negro men are murdered with impunity. Negro women raped, beaten, mutilated. The slaveholding class controls the wealth, the land, 
the intelligence, indeed the very government. They are masters still. The new world is slavery without the chains, Mr. Secretary. This is no victory. Mr. Langston, when I was a boy, stop. my father made me swear an eternal hostility. I said hostility. stop! No more stories. Do you want to sit on the Supreme Court? You can either walk out of this office with your dignity intact and your future with the Republican Party assured, or Johnson's men can drag you out of here in chains and you can live out the rest of your days in a federal penitentiary. Compromise is a very devil. I know. I made a deal with one. Suffer your pride, because if you don't, I'll have lost my very soul for nothing. Mr. Langston. John. What? I'm sorry. <laughs> Take care of yourself. <laughs> Marshal McPhail! <coughs> yes, sir. Order the men outside to stand down and return to their posts. I'm coming out. December 24th, 1869. Like the sound of the fall of a mighty pine in the stillness of the woods, as an Indian orator once said of a chief of his tribe, comes to us from Washington the news of the death of Edwin M. Stanton. Words cannot adequately express the important part which this extraordinary man so well performed from the beginning to the end of the Civil War. It was the patriotism exhibited by Stanton that marked him out to President Lincoln as his man for the War Office. At this point in our history, January 1862, the prospect for a Union victory was discouraging. In this fearful crisis, Edwin Stanton stepped in upon the scene. He organized war on a grand scale, and with his ferocious, unrelenting quality, brought about a swift end to the bloody conflict. Through this most trying of times, Stanton never failed and never flinched. It may be said by some that he was rough, imperious, despotic, cruel, and offensive in many things. Measured, however, by the hatred of the implacable adherents of the rebellion, in his services to the Union, he stands first in the list of the great champions of the cause. He was also an eminently distinguished lawyer, fully qualified for the position he doggedly pursued his entire career. President Grant appointed Edwin Stanton to the Supreme Court on December 19th of this year. Five short days later, with his wife and children by his side, Edwin Stanton's life would expire. His name will live, and his memory will be revered so long as the enduring principles of union, liberty, equal rights, and law survive in the minds of men. His friends, in view of his services as a public man, are millions in number, while the enemies he leaves behind him, with a few exceptions, are the unhappy mourners over the lost cause. is an airship production starring Jeremy Schwartz as Edwin Stanton also featuring Lindsey Graham Robert McCullum Sean Hannigan Joel Farrell R. Bruce Elliott J. Michael Tatum Stephen Walters Aaron Roberts Ian Ferguson Ace Anderson and William Jackson Harper created by Stephen Walters and Eric Archilla written and directed by Stephen Walters Executive Producer, Lindsey Graham. Co-Executive Producers, Eric Archilla, Robert McCollum, and Stephen Walters. Music and Sound Design by Lindsey Graham. To find out more about 1865, go to 1865podcast.com or find us on Facebook and Twitter at 1865podcast. And if you're a fan of the show, please consider supporting us. Become a patron at patreon.com slash 1865podcast. New episodes air weekly and look for special Inside the Episode interviews with the writers and producers of the series to find out more about the real history behind 1865.